From the Asgard Company Studios in beautiful Wichita Falls, Texas, from the finest mind in the modern fitness industry, the one true voice in the strength and conditioning profession, the most important podcast on the internet. Ladies and gentlemen, starting Strength Radio. Welcome back to Starting Strength Radio. Uh, it's Friday, but it's about to be Saturday so fast you can't believe it. Because today we're talking to Fred Ashmore again. Fred is the, it's our buddy that ran the Cannonball Run, the famous race from. Well, it's a timed event. It's not really a race. It was, it was just one person at a time doing it. Uh, from uh, a garage in Manhattan to another a hotel in Southern California in Los Angeles or something. And uh, he did this in about three and a half hours, and it's never been done that fast before. And, uh, well, it was, it, what did it actually take, Fred? Uh, it took me the better part of 25 hours and 55 minutes. 25 hours and 55 minutes, which is less than 26 hours. Now, <clears throat> you can't do that. Okay, let me point out that you people can't do that. And uh, the way Fred did it is uh, he had a lot of gasoline in tanks in the car. He had modified the car, took the seats out, replaced them with gas tanks so that he only had to stop for gas like once in Oklahoma. And... uh, and just drove real goddamn fast the the rest of the time. I think your uh, average speed was 106. Is that right? The overall average was 106. My moving average was 110. So overall average of 106 miles an hour. And you'll notice the the matter of fact way that Fred addresses this fact. Fred is different than you and I. And what we want to talk to Fred about today is something that uh, is of interest to you and I. Fred knows cars. And I wanted to talk to Fred about cars. Now, we all like cars here at Starting Strength Radio. We've all got nice cars. We kind of think they're fun, right? I think they're fun. I've got a couple of pretty cool cars. Uh I've had several pretty cool cars. Nick's got some cool cars. We, you know, the kids, of course, are just children and they don't have any. They don't have cars. They don't think about them like that. Rusty's just a child. Bree's just a little girl. And, you know, eventually they will eventually, eventually maybe end up with a neat car. But those of you guys listening to the, listening to Starting Strength Radio today appreciate cars and I wanted to talk to Fred about cars and uh, I I think we'll start off uh, the show with asking Fred about his favorite cars what do you what do you like Fred you've driven a hell of a bunch of cars real fast what's been your favorite one to drive real fast um you know, I, I was, you know, very blessed to, to be able to get a lot of the cool cars I always wanted as a child. Uh, there's a couple that have escaped me that I, I haven't had the opportunity. Um, years and years ago, uh, when I was a kid, I got to ride in a Lamborghini, which, which always, you know, caught my interest. Um, I, I really am an American muscle car guy. I really, um, the, the American muscle car, as it morphed into, like, your Pantera's, your De Tomaso Mangusta, you know, uh, cars like that. I, I really enjoy kind of the the Carroll Shelby style, you know, Ace, where they put the big motors in it. Uh, that's really my style. I've always had a really, really soft spot for, you know, uh, mid-70s Aston Martin. Uh, kind of looks like a Mustang, too, but for some reason that car's always caught my attention. Oh, it's a beautiful car, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that will be the one that, that, uh, eventually when I, I get retired and settle down, that'll be the one in the garage. 
that, you know, someday when, you know, we stop doing this stuff and I just do some cars and coffee or, you know, settle down a little bit, which I really don't plan on doing anytime soon, that that Aston Martin is probably one that will fill up the garage. Now, the, the Aston Martin you're talking about is is the James Bond car, right? Or was that? No, that's the 60s. That was the DB4, right? Or the DB3? Yep. Yeah, this is a, this is a later Aston Martin. Um, I only I've only ever come across it a couple times if for sale, and it's it's still obtainable for a guy like me to to have. You know, it's it's not you know ridiculous like the DB the DB fours or the you know DB sixes and stuff. So you know, it's uh, it's one of those cars I've always loved. I I don't know what it was that kind of attracted me to that car, but you know that's the cool thing about cars is certain things about all cars attract people. That's why we have people that collect pacers or gremlins or, <laughs> you know, kit cars or, or what, what have you. So there's always something about them that draws you to them. And that, that Aston Martin is something that, you know, I've always, you know, kind of caught my eye and it's different enough that everybody doesn't like it. That's, that's one of the cliches. I really, really stay away from. I'm not a cliche car guy. Um, I, I happen to have a like for Mustangs, but, most of the Mustangs I have had have been, you know, odd Mustangs or, you know, the semi unobtainables that, you know, I saw as a childhood. And, and so I really like, um, I've got a couple, uh, pre-production cars, pre-release cars, um, corporate cars that I have in my fleet that those are the type of things I like to collect. Uh, they're, they're different enough that, um, it's, it's kind of a niche thing. You, a lot of your uh, experimental cars are, are very niche or very cliche. People either like them or they don't. And just like a baseball car, a car is only worth what somebody else wants to pay for it. So along right. the lines, I've, I've managed to pick up a couple of these cars, uh, promotional cars that Ford had, and uh, kind of squirreled them away. And who knows, maybe someday they'll be worth something. Have you driven the Aston Martin you're talking about, or is this just something you've seen? Uh, no, I, I've never, I've never had the opportunity to drive one. I've really, I really never met anybody that has one, uh, to, to the point where I've never even actually got to be in person with one. Uh, I've been in, you know, in person with the James Bond ones and the, you know, the later Aston Martins that they've come out with, but that this model's kind of eluded me and, you know, eluded my friends as far as anybody having one around here. So, you know, I, I can send you a picture of it and, uh, of, of what it looks like. And it's, it's kind of, like I said, it kind of has a, uh, uh, slight resemblance to a, a Mustang too, you know, with the front of the car, but it also, you know, is different enough that it's not everybody's right. you know, car that they want. Well, let's talk about the Mustangs. You, you mentioned Mustangs. I've only had one Mustang. Uh, I just sold my 2010 Shelby GT 500. And uh, I just got through selling that a couple of months ago. And uh, I, I have got a, now I've got a, a Porsche. I've got a 911 Carrera S Porsche. And I've got a rather special BMW M6. And I, compared to those cars, I could not stand the way that Mustang drove. I just hated it. It scared me. It was a frightening experience to drive. You get that thing up to 110 miles an hour, and it's it may not stay on the ground. It was all there. It could be a handful. You get you get north of the the triple digits in those, and and that's always been a Mustang thing. And mm -hmm. I think they've they've curtailed a lot of that with you know reintroducing the IRS back under them. Uh, Ford first did that in uh, I believe the 2003 Terminators. And they got a lot of flack from, you know, motorsports in general. So they went back to the live axle and took it away from the, the 0304 car. And as soon as they did that, everybody said, well, why didn't, why didn't you leave the IRS in the back of it? And uh, so when they come out with the 15 model, they put the IRS back in them. Yeah, I, this, this thing had a solid rear, uh, rear end. It just a solid axle rear end. And it was the oversteer on that thing was just horrible. And... Uh, Oh God, I hated it. I really did. I I didn't like it at first. I didn't know why I didn't like it, but then I, 
I got to investigating, and that it's the the independent rear suspension is kind of important if you're going to go fast, right? No, definitely, definitely. And uh, I, I think I think like you said that that uh, ninety nine to 04 Cobra with that IRS in the back of it made it such a better car to drive. And it, when I uh, built my Fox body, the seventy nine Cobra that I uh, broke the event record with. That car, I put IRS in the back of it, the Cobra 4 cam, and the car was, was just a dream to drive for a Fox body. And uh, I, I really think that, you know, Ford kind of, you know, went against the grain going backwards and put, uh, putting a solid live axle back in that. And I think it took away from them for a while. And, and I think they were just trying to balance that act out. And I think they finally just smartened up and went back to IRS and put their car back where it belongs. Well, uh, this thing that I had, uh, well, the guy I bought it from had put a adjustable panhard bar on the back end of the thing, and I could. It didn't help at all. It was it was just a death trap. It was a fucking death trap, and uh, you know I'm glad somebody else is having fun with that thing. Now it was, you know, in its defense, it started every time I got in it. It was good, dependable transportation, and it, it sounded great. And, uh, you know, you pull up to the gas station, and everybody wants to admire the damn thing. Uh, so, I mean, I had a lot of fun with it, but it just it's not a long-term car to, to buy and keep if you're really interested in driving the thing, you know. It's, it's really a niche car. Uh they really built a crazy car there. I think it was the 13 and 14s. Those had, uh, they had a 5.8, you know, uh, and that thing had, I think, like 660 horse from the factory. Yeah. With that's... like the same thing, live axle. And we, it, it's no wonder all these people with, you know, no experiences going out and leaving car shows and running into people and stuff because the, the south side catches the north side so fast. And yeah. Of... Oh, yeah. Oh, it's you can see all kinds of videos of that on the on the internet people coming out of a parking lot with too much right foot and ending up in a tree, you know? Oh yeah. Cause it's the, you can't control the car. It's, 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 it's a, you know, like a real, real, real fast engine in a dump truck. Oh, that's, that's a very good way to put it. I, yeah. I was thinking more like a shopping cart. Because yeah. you can't really control the wheels on it. <laughs> the, so it's... the wheels aren't controllable. <laughs> so, Fred, how many cars do you actually own right now? Right now, everything, lock, stock, and barrel, probably about 330. 330 cars. Yep. And where do you keep them? Uh, most of them here in Oklahoma, but I have uh, probably 30 back home in Maine. So I, I've got a lot of stuff. I got a lot of Boy, you do, of don't stuff. you? Yeah. Now, I could hear the guys laughing at me in the back. Yeah, well, they're, they're wondering if, if you've got them all tagged and insured. No, 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 no. Well, that, that would be impossible. So, no, uh, that'd be foolishness. I don't license my stuff. I drive so fast, if I'm going to get pulled over, I'm going to jail anyway. Well, that's, that's <laughs> probably true. And uh, as Fred told us last time, he's never been to jail. <laughs> no, I've never been. Now, where I'd have behaved that way, <laughs> things would be different. But uh, I never said I sh never should have gone to jail. <laughs> that's a different matter entirely, isn't it? Yes. Oh, God almighty. So... What, uh, if you were going to build a car and maybe you've done this, uh, to drive, you know, uh, around town, which, you know, would mean, you know, just normal use 105 miles an hour occasionally, uh, you know, good low, uh, RPM torque. You know, a fun car to drive. What would it be? Fun car to drive, man. Uh, it, it's awful tough for me to 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 not like just the 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 last series of the four-eyed foxes, the the eighty-six the eighty-six fox body. 
I really, really liked that car. I, so you're, you're talking about a Mustang. Yep. Right. Yep. Which one, which ones were these? Um, the, the four eyed foxes were the first series. They went from 79 to 86. And then in 87, they changed them over to the plastic headlights. So we had what they call the arrow swap. And then the Fox was the Fox. The original Fox series was done in 93. And, and this was a, this is a, a, a model of Mustang that was produced by Ford or is this a, is this an aftermarket modification to a stock car? What, no, uh, they call four-eyed foxes because they had four four square headlights, as adverse to the later ones that had the plastic headlights. So they always called them four eyes. Um, that was kind of a, a term that they started using loosely for the the first series of fox bodies. And the last year for them was 1986. And the fox body was which one? The fox body uh, was the little. It was after the Mustang II. Right. The first series, right after the Mustang II. And the, the original Fox body, four-eyed, ran from 79 to 86. They made that car for how long? The, the actual first series made, uh, made it for seven years. And then the, the second series of it, which called the Aero Cars, they ran from 87 to, to uh, 93. That's, that's the GT Mustang that you see in all the Vanilla Ice videos and, and like... Um, you know, all the 80s TV shows like Magnum P.I. and stuff like that. You'd see a lot of those those 87 to 93 GTs in there. The platform of the Fox, they ran up all the way to 2004. But um, Mustang-wise, to me, the, the true Fox bodies are the, are the first, first series of the Mustang. So. And what did they put in those? Oh, they started out with, a re- they started out with everything from a four-cylinder. Um, <laughs> Right up to the, the biggest motor they actually ever put in one from the factory was just a 302. Right. Um, they did get modded, uh, Roush modded one with, a, uh, I believe, a twin turbocharged 351 for the Mustang anniversary car. And there was a, a couple companies out there that stuck some 351 Windsors in them, but there were nothing that was factory um, in the first series. The second series, um, they put a 351 Windsor in the Cobra R model. And then they turned into the modular four six five four motors. That's that's similar to the Coyote you see today. So, in a situation like this, for just a driving around town car like that, you would prefer one of these to a Corvette. Yeah, honestly, um, I I am not a Corvette fan. I have uh, I couldn't agree. I I don't like them. I don't. I think they're stupid looking. I think the best looking one they ever made was a stupid looking car, and I just don't like that body style. I don't like a two seater. I like a coupe. I don't like a two seater, but the they haven't ever had the rear end correctly. It just doesn't look good to me. And uh, I mean, like a '64 is nice. That looks like a car, right? But the rest of these things all look like Hot Wheels to me, and it just they're just silly looking. And I've never wanted one, I've never owned one, never had any reason to even ask about one. Just, you know, not on my screen at all. And you, you feel the same way about them, I guess. No, I've always, everybody's always asked me about the, the um, 70s Corvettes, and, and I always told everyone, I said, the... Save you the money, go out, buy a 16-foot aluminum boat, put a big motor on the back of it, and ride it across the choppy lake. Now you have a Corvette. <laughs> that's, that's, it's no different. You sit down in the back of them. You're trying to look over the front. you got these, like, bat wings up on the front. You can't see anything. Right. They, they ride like crap. They really don't handle that great. They're just To me, they were just an overpriced novelty. Right. Right. Blind spots are bad. And... Uh... Corvettes have always been bad about blind spots. I had a, I had three Z cars back uh, a while back. I had a, the first one was an 84. Then I had a 90. Then I had a 95, 300 ZX. Fun little cars to drive. Handled great, but my God, blind spot city. You, you, you can't see out of the back of the damn thing. 
<laughs> no, and and uh, I was very surprised when I drove the new Camaro. You know that um, you know Chevrolet kept that on. You know without being able to see them. The Z cars I like. I've always liked, you know, right from the first series of the Z cars, you know, right up front right. they come out with the 300. Of my biggest issue of the Z cars and just not fitting in it. Right. I just that to me, um, it was like uh, tattooing a <laughs> Nissan emblem on my chest. <laughs> there's really, there's just like really no way for me to fit in it and feel. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed mine. I drove those things for about 20 years and, uh, uh, hell that first one, that 84 had a, that was the first year they put that V six that, uh, that was that a three Oh three liter V six factory balanced engine. Uh, I bought that thing and drove it, uh, for, a long time and uh it had uh 275,000 miles on it when I got when I sold it to a buddy of mine's son and that rotten little bastard drove the car up until it was I think he had 340,000 miles on that and and he wrecked it it was still running like a sewing machine you know, I mean, Nissan knows how to make an engine. And, uh, man, that thing, I, they must have made 50 million of those little three-liter V6s. That was a great little engine. Oh, I, I think I've only ever replaced one of them. And I think it, see, where I'm from in Maine is they, they usually don't get those miles because they rot out. Right. So, you know, you'll, you'll have, you know, great motor and a, a great, great car. But, you know, all of a sudden you'll go out one day and the lower control arm will be hanging out on the ground or, <laughs> or you know, something will be broken out of it. And, and, Rusted off. Right. Yeah, now you have this great motor, but you have you have no shell left to put it in. So, right. Um, yeah, that Nissan motor is a great motor. And, and I really like the Z cars. I, and I think it's along the same lines as what we talked about, you know, with like the, the Corvette. It's a niche that, that you like them or there's something that attracts you to them. And uh, they're... They have a great following. The Z following is amazing. I, I have I have sold lots of parts to the Z guys over the years, and and most of them are, are really good guys. And, and and it's actually a really good product. The car. Oh, it's an excellent car. Yeah. Excellent car. That they quit making those in '96, and uh, the last one I had was a '95, and that was a beautiful body too. That the last generation Z car was a pretty car. And they weren't just insanely fast, you know. They were like a three hundred horsepower car, but they were uh, they were just fun to drive. They were little pocket rocket. Yeah, yeah, it was a great little car. And uh, Nick's got one of the new ones. What is your what you got a fifteen? It's a fifteen three seventy Z twenty fifteen. And they didn't make a coupe in that. They just that's a no, two seater. No, it's all They've been two seaters since. Uh, right. They the didn't make a two. Z. They used to call that a two plus two. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. what they called. The, both of my head were were had a back seat, and I liked the way the body looked with that little bit longer body. I thought it was a prettier car yeah, than the two seater. I agree. Uh, and then the new one, the the four hundred that's coming out is still a two seater. I think they're just going to stick with two seater. Probably if I'm are not mistaken. What engine is in yours? Three and a half liter? 3.7. 3. Oh, that's the 370. Uh, <laughs> right. <clears throat> well, I've I've driven Nick's car and it's a it's a fun little car. You know, it's not as fast as this other shit I've got, but Yeah, but it, uh, it's really tough. You it's... know, I talk about the Fox body that, you know, I'd like to drive if I was just driving around grocery getting riding around town. Um I, I really I really think it's it's tough to beat the new cars. It's it's really tough to get in an old car and hope the AC works or hope the windows <laughs> yeah. leave and go up or you know anything like that. Yeah. So. Hope the carburetor float doesn't stick and hydro lock the engine. <laughs> There's so many advantages to newer cars. Uh, oh my God! I used to have an old '79 model Chevrolet pickup, three quarter ton pickup that I would haul horses down the highway in an old bumper pull trailer 
and I had beefed the rear end of that truck up. It had 11 leaves in the spring set. And it didn't drive normally until you had a trailer on the bumper with three horses at the back of the thing. But the, the way a modern truck drives versus that death trap son of a bitch, it's, it's night and day. I'm surprised I'm still alive. I really am. Because that was a dangerous vehicle to be driving around because it sways from side to side and it just, you know, it didn't have a front end of any description in it. And it was the, the advances in, I mean, a, a modern Camry handles better than that DB three that you're talking about. Definitely. A modern Camry is better than that. It's, it's amazing what they have done. With, uh, with the, with the chassis and suspension components of modern cars, it's just there's like night and day. Imagine driving a '53 Chevrolet. You know the shifter up on the column, and you know my dad has a '53 uh, Henry J, a '53 Henry J Kaiser, and I drive that around town when I'm back home in Maine. Just for the challenge. <laughs> oh, it's it, it, you know when you don't. You don't ride on anybody's bumper either because you need at least 10 car lengths to stop it. Yeah, yeah, I didn't. The The brakes they put in those things are a suggestion. You know, I, I, I'm now going to suggest to the car that it begins to slow down. You know, and several days later, you know, come to them. People don't realize that... Uh... The, the brakes back then, most most cars were manual, so they used the motor to stop more so than the brakes. So they would actually gear the car down before right. it got to the stop sign. Well, people now just smash on the brake when they get to the stop sign, and, you know, that they rely on all the brakes to stop. But. Well, drum brakes, you know, were, were not as effective at slowing the car down as the engine was. You know, I mean, if, if some people older people, you know, that learned to slow down with the engine a long time ago don't realize that a modern car with disc brakes, you don't use the engine to slow the car down. That's what the brakes are for. But, help, that's not the way it used to be. No. Nope, not at all. Have you ever driven, and this is a, uh, and you may, have, you may have driven one of these damn things. Have you ever driven an old, nice car, like a Cord or an Auburn or a Duesenberg? Uh, I've driven a Pierce Arrow. A Pierce Arrow. I'm not sure if you're terribly familiar. I, Yeah, I I remember the Pierce Arrow. That was, uh, I'm old enough to where people were driving those back when I was a little kid. Yeah, yeah. You had to have been a pretty little kid. These, yeah. these old buggers... Uh, there was actually a lawsuit from uh, Pierce Arrow sued Ford Motor Company because the one thing Pierce Arrow was known for was their headlights coming out of their fenders. So when Ford adopted that platform in the late 30s, um, Pierce Arrow actually sued them. And, and uh, I can't remember what the outcome was in court. I don't know if they had to pay royalties or not. But your Pierce Arrow was really, you know, around the, the lines of a you know early Rolls Royce, which I. I haven't driven one, but I've, I've been in one of the early Rolls Royces before as well. Right. My brother-in-law had a Packard at one time. That's how old I am. I got a 47. I got a 47. This probably was a late 40s Packard. It was. I remember it. It was dark green. A pretty car. Pretty car. Lacquer on it, I think. A what? I got a 47 Packard limousine. Do you? <laughs> yeah. But you've never driven a Cord or a, an Auburn, right? No. Um, that's, when you start getting into cars like that, I, I enjoy those cars, but that's kind of where I'm different from a lot of people. I can look at a car and I can enjoy it for his, what it brought to history and its aesthetics. Right. But... I also understand the difference between at a certain point when you get into cars like that, you don't own the car. The car owns you. And so 
Uh, I'm very much, I can appreciate their spot in history, but it's something that I'm just as content looking at as I would be to driving it just because, you know, it's one of those deals. Anything silly could happen. Right, right. It's just not very, very huge. You're not, you, it's, it's almost as though, yeah, I see what you mean by that. You're owning a piece of history. If you've got a Duesenberg and you're, you're more responsible to it than it ever will be to you. Yeah. You know, I mean, they haven't made parts for those cars. It, 70 years and uh they're just a lot of trouble to drive yeah most of all that stuff jay leno has jay leno you know is you know president of the more money than god club and and a lot of times he's out he has to have parts made because they just right. don't exist right and when you have something that's in that category you know somebody somebody like me if that was my car I, I would never want to own it because I would I didn't wouldn't want to drive it. And my car, is, I, I'd be taking the Duesenberg down to McDonald's if it was my car. Right. And it's just it, I'm not the right person for that car. I I, right. I couldn't appreciate it in that way. Whereas I enjoy cars, and I had a really good buddy. I have a, a '70 Boss 302 I'm, I'm building and been building for years. Belonged to my uncle, and my buddy said to me, he goes, "You know, I really wish I built my Boss 302 like you're doing yours." And I asked him why, and, and that's where this came from, you know, what, what I've been saying about them owning you. He said, I can't enjoy my car. He goes, I have an MCA Gold Boss 302. He said, I might be able to drive it once a year on a really good day. He said, but the rest of the year, it has a heated garage, climate controlled. I have to carry a ridiculous amount of insurance on it. And honestly, he said, you know, the car owns me. I don't get to enjoy my car that I cherish so much. And he goes, and you're actually building your car so you can race it across the country or you can, you know, drive right. wherever you want to go. And, and you're, you're not, you're, you're, you're doing it right is what he said to me. There's, there's plenty of cars that deserve that pedigree. And, you know, the Cords and Duesenbergs are cars from the history that do. Um, I'm that guy. That if it's in my garage, it's going to get driven. Right. Well, that, that's an interesting, that's an interesting uh, thing to talk about. There are two types of people that buy a lot of cars. There are guys like your buddy, and I've got a friend that, that does the same thing. He's got several cars. But he, he ends up keeping them in a garage and taking them out to the car wash and driving them back. And he just likes owning the things. He's a collector. And these aren't even particularly hideously expensive cars. It's just stuff he likes. and he, But he doesn't drive it. Correct. On the other hand, I've got this stupid BMW M6 with a stroker motor in it that's, you know, 675 horsepower car. And it's, you know, it's a three pedal M6. It's a, it's a rare car. They only made 323 of the damn things. And in, in the six year production run, they made 323 of these cars with a clutch. And I've got one of them. This damn thing is, is way too fast. But I drive it. I drive it every day I can drive it. It stays dirty. I don't care if the paint is scratched. I don't care if it's got door dings on it. I drive the car. I don't, I don't house the car. I drive the car. And it sounds like you're kind of the same kind of person I, I wouldn't anymore have a Duesenberg and tie up that kind of capital and something I can't actually enjoy because I can't enjoy it if I'm looking at it if I just want to look at it I just get a picture of a Duesenberg yeah it's exactly you know exactly but if I can't get in it and drive the damn thing around and from what I understand those cars are a lot of fun to drive that's a hundred mile an hour car yeah made 1935 or whenever the hell they their little short production run was, they were a hundred mile an hour car. Now on, on 50 mile an hour tires. Exactly. Right. Very, very true. Non-radial bias. Right. Bias ply tires going a hundred miles an hour down the highway. You have to have a screw loose to do something like that, but they didn't know any better. They didn't know what a radial tire was. Back then that was the best they had and it didn't matter. I mean, that was that was the way it was. It 
you know, to say you went 100 miles an hour back then was a big deal. Yes. I mean, that, that, was, that was an accomplishment. Yeah, it didn't. Most, most stuff didn't do that. And uh, an, an Auburn that would go 110 miles an hour, that's a, that was a wealthy man's car. It was, a, it, was a, it was an organized crime boss's car. And uh, boy, I remember watching uh, Packard set all those land speed records. Uh, it, it was old film, but they showed from back in the 30s when Packard went to you know a racetrack and drove for some ridiculous. Back then, it was ridiculous speed for a certain number of hours, and and just the, the endurance and stuff that that really had something to say back then. And you know, you're looking, you know, 90 years later, and you look back on that stuff for their time and their technology you know, where they were and what they accomplished mm -hmm. was, was really mind blowing. Yeah. It was quite a deal in the thirties going a hundred miles an hour. People thought you would die if you went a hundred miles an hour, just human body can't go that fast. Well, you know? well, here's an odd perspective to put on it. Most of your major manufacturers didn't even have hydraulic brakes at that point. Most of them still had mechanical rod brakes. Oh, on God them, almighty. Or cable brakes. I hadn't even thought about that. That's true. They didn't have any kind of hydraulics anywhere on that car. The clutch was a mechanical clutch. Yeah. Just a linkage. I'm pretty sure General Motors was, was one of the first with the hydraulics. You know, it, it started in the 30s, but I know Ford, you know, didn't come along with their hydraulic brakes, I think, until like 38, 39. So, I mean... And they were these were the big time manufacturers. So you know you're talking about these guys with with uh, hand built cars like Duesenberg, like Cord, like Auburn. Uh, there's so many more we could name. Uh, Packard, you know, Packard was a little more you know production car. Uh, Pierce Arrow, and you know they're out doing stuff over 100 miles an hour on very you know skeptical brakes at best. And you know, on a track, not on the highway, obviously. You know, you can't drive a car like that on the highway if you might have to stop. No. Yep. Yep. Or, or how about this? Well, let's go another step. How about wooden wheels? You're not far out of the wooden wheel era. Yeah. Well, that's certainly true. I wonder how you balance a wooden wheel. <laughs> <laughs> it gets wet and gets out of balance. Yeah. You go through a puddle and your spokes start swelling up. <laughs> Part of the spoke starts swelling up. <laughs> Depending on how old the tree was and how good right, it was. Right, right. <laughs> oh, God. Well, what about cars that everybody else likes and that you don't? Everybody else likes that I don't. Um, well, we already talked about a Corvette, you know. Corvette's a is a good example of that. Everybody, you know, most people think that uh, the the pinnacle of American automotive technology is the is the Chevrolet Corvette. And uh, we can touch on the Corvette for a minute. And, and here's my perspective on it. And some people are going to throw rocks at the radio. Um, my issue with the Corvette is really simple. Corvette has always followed technology they've never been the pinnacle of technology when the c8 came out all the chevrolet guys were like oh my word the you know second coming of christ and, you know the c8's out well that's awesome but you know ford had that technology in the 60s and ran it for years and you know that mid-engine technology has been around for almost 60 years mm -hmm. why is why is this some great pinnacle of american sports car that we're finally releasing a mid-engine corvette and you know, the 2020s. I mean, that's, that's really not the pinnacle of technology when you look at it. You can look back, you know, way back into the 60s. You could buy a GT40 and drive it on the street. I mean, <laughs> or a Pantera. You could buy a Pantera and drive it on the street. So and that's, that's really my, my thoughts behind the Corvette. We're about pinnacles of technology. To me, I, I think it's a, a great, uh, I, I think it's, it's good. I like that they've come out with the C8. Um, my point basically behind it is I think they're kind of a ways behind the eight ball in the fact that it took them so long to build one. But in realistics, you know, what General Motors has always done is they've always kind of um, 
they're the guys who's always let everybody else test the waters. Right. Okay, you jump you you jump off the cliff first, and let's see if you live when you hit the water. Right. And then so then then you jump in and, and you know you're in over your head and you swim to shore and stuff and you do it several times. Well, now that they know it's safe, they're gonna jump off and they're gonna do a backflip. Well, speaking of that, whatever happened to the Fiero? Do you remember that car? Oh yeah, yeah. The that was a mid-engine car. That. Uh, I actually got a kind of a kick out of the Fiero because um, when the C8 came out, I said, "Well, well, that's great. I'm glad Corvette brought out a new base for the uh, kit cars of America, <laughs> so the Fiero can now be retired." <laughs> <laughs> oh God, they only made that thing what three or four years. Oh man, they made a couple versions of it too. They had a four-cylinder version, and they had a V6 version, and they had a a fastback version of it. That was a Pontiac label, right? Well, yes, Pontiac. Pontiac. Yeah. Let's go back a little further than that. How about the Corvair? I had a Corvair. I had a '64 model Corvair. No, it was a '65, a '65 model Corvair with a flat four engine in that thing had a boxer motor in it and uh, i had that thing a couple of years i bought it real used but i tell you what i love that little car it was fun to drive little car the thing handled flat it was it was a great little car and uh you know then ralph nader had to had to come along and destroy the thing but uh because the gas tank for those of you who don't remember the gas tank was in the front and you know they faked up some video of explosions and people you know burning to death in the front seat of a corvair and it just you know so chevrolet had to discontinue the damn things but those were good little cars now so do you re do you remember that back then which the, the corvair was a spoof off of the volkswagen because it had that pancake <clears throat> six in it and they actually made a Corvair bus called the Greenbrier that actually had the same rear engine mount in it. But it, like the Volkswagen, it didn't have any heat. So my dad had one back in the day with the side door on it. And he actually had a propane heater in it so he could have <laughs> If I remember correctly, my Corvair was the first car I owned that had a manual transmission. And I don't believe I had, no, I think I had a truck prior to that that had a three-speed manual in it. Uh, and nowadays, the uh, I think the numbers are that the national fleet in the United States is 96% automatic transmission. Does that sound about right? I, I, that would not surprise me at all. It's. I mean, the overwhelming vast majority is uh, is automatic transmissions, and I have always. I, I mean, I don't own a car with an automatic transmission. I will not buy one. It's just a. I'm just odd in that way, and I I like to drive the car. I like to shift gears. I think it's part of driving the car is operating the engine as it interfaces with the wheels and not letting the transmission do that for me. I just like the control that I have when I'm in charge of the engine power at the wheels. What do you think about the trend away from uh, manual transmission? Uh, the only good thing about it that I can think of right now is that, uh, most people can't steal any of my cars <laughs> because they don't know how to drive the damn things. Well, that's a good anti-theft. And, and you, you had asked me before I, I kind of, you know, beat up on the C8 a little bit of what was the thing I don't like about cars. And I think probably one of the biggest things I do not like about cars is the fact that they nannyize them. Oh, yeah. Everything from... It, and I think a lot of it started with the Ford Explorer when, you know, I had people driving around on flat tires, rolling trucks over and it became Ford's fault. And, and you know, I think we were probably raised around this, the same time where 
you know, we were taught how to change a flat tire. That was part of driver's ed class. I had already knew how to do it. Um, but now we got tire sensor monitors to tell you if your tire's flat. We have... And they never work. Yeah. Yeah, they're always broke. They're always broke. Yeah. And that's the same thing with the manual transmission. I think, I think 99% of the time, the reason we have the problems we do and a lot of accidents is because people don't understand the machinery they're operating. If, you, if you're going to go be a forklift driver in a forklift plant, you need to take a class on how to operate a forklift, or you're supposed to, not that I do. But um, they do that because people need to understand the machinery that they're driving. And, you know, taking all the controls, we're almost in an autonomous, you know, era where people aren't even going to drive the car anymore. I think that, that <laughs> what, what's happened is, you know, the first, the first thing to kind of castrate the automobile was to take the shifter out of it. You know, that's kind of a pun, I understand, but... You know, you take the manual shifter out. No, that's that's exactly what they've done. You just, you set it one time, put it in drive, and just now your right foot is driving the car, and that's the only thing that you have to, the only way you interact with the car is with your right foot. Yep. And it's it's just, it's not any fun. No, no, no. And uh, that's, that's, to me, was has been become the death of the automobile Um we're basically getting to the point now we're just riding in pause. You know, the, the car tells you if, I mean, it's gotten to the point now, if a car gets up alongside you, your car starts beeping in the mirror because there's a car next to you. Right. You know, if you're, somebody's too close to you or you're approaching them too fast, it starts beeping and applying the brakes. I mean, to me, the, the biggest thing I don't like about cars is the nannyization because I think, number one, it takes a lot of responsibility out. Uh, away from the person behind the wheel and you know puts it on the manufacturers where the way i look at it is the manufacturer gave you something to drive it's up to you to learn how to drive it properly uh, it's heading in one direction it's heading in the direction that if you have a wreck the manufacturer is 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 liable not you i mean i see it going in that direction yeah uh, well it's you look at it with the airbags i mean they they've already they're already, you know, uh, General Motors had all those airbags with Takio, Kiko, or, or some. Takata is the name of that company. Uh, and you know that that company is owned. You, you wonder why Takata has not been sued by everybody out of existence? Because it's owned by the manufacturers. Yeah. It's a wholly owned subsidiary of both Ford and GM and Chrysler. Yep. And the Japanese companies are all involved in it so that uh, they are providing products to the, to the car manufacturers and the car manufacturers aren't going to sue themselves. I've got recalls on two pickups that I've got that I just hadn't, I need to go get it done. I just been fucking around and hadn't done it, but I have that driver's column airbag replaced. So that it doesn't launch shrapnel through your chest when, you know, if you hit a pig on the highway or something like that. Yep. But uh, I hit a, I've only had an airbag deploy one time. I hit a feral hog on my way home one night in my, in my M6. Yep. And I was probably going 60 and I hit this 250 pound hog. Oh, it was, it was uh Oh, uh, it was quite surprising. And, uh, <laughs> and my knee airbag deployed. I didn't even know there was a knee airbag. And the damn thing hits me in the shin, just bruised the fuck out of me. The, the, and, you know, of course, the, the steering column airbags, eh, you get that dust all over you and shit. And I, they, you know, they wanted to total that car out because the airbags had deployed. Oh, it's I, I see it all the time. And I I just had to yell at him and argue with him and shit to leave me alone and just pay the I mean the claim ended up being fifteen grand. That car is worth a lot of money because all the aftermarket shit that's on it. But uh I they wanted to total the car on the basis of the safety equipment going off. That's how built into this business model all that all the, the safety equipment in that car is now. Yeah. Well, I think what you'll find is, is it's a, a coconut shell game where, you know, 
everybody sues everybody and everybody puts everybody in line as to who's going to get sued. And when one person isn't sued, well, and they move the coconut to the back of the line and, you know, try to sue the next person. And, you know, the airbags, you know, like you said, um, the, those companies, the insurance companies are trying to take their liability out of it and say, hey, your car is totaled. We don't have to fix it because they look at a secondary liability. Ah. The car gets fixed and they wreck it again. Right. The airbag doesn't go off. This doesn't happen. Now we're, you know, back to an insurance company because, you know, it, it gets back to what you said about the manufacturer. Somebody's got to be at fault. Um, I've only had one airbag go off in my face. And um, I was uh, working. I would worked a really, really long shift a couple days in a row. And I was on my way home and I fell asleep and I rolled my truck. It hit the it hit the uh, culvert um, of a driveway and it went end for end. And when it come down, it came down on the back bumper and the airbag went off and it blew my face through the back of the cab, uh, blew, blew my head through the back of the cab of a regular cab pickup. Wow. It's, you know, scars ripped my face all off over here. And uh, I didn't sue anybody. <laughs> well, well, you're a nice guy, Fred. That would have been very tempting, wouldn't it? The uh, yeah, no, I I agree with uh, I agree with that. I think that uh, th there's going to be a point at which uh, any car worth having is going to be fifteen, twenty years old. I mean, f for what I understand. Uh, Mercedes Benz hasn't put a clutch in a car since 05. It's not even an option. You can't buy those little fast Mercedes with a with a manual transmission. No, an AMG, no. Uh -huh. BMW is the same way. They've stopped putting a manual transmission in a car. You just can't buy one. Well, I'm sure on the warranty end of it, it's probably become, you know, so few people can even drive them now that it's become an expense for the dealers, a warranty of right. burned out and, you know. Yeah, having to stock parts, you know. Yeah. I've got two Dodge pickups. I've got, uh, they're both uh, four-door, long, wide beds. Uh, one is four-wheel drive, one is two-wheel drive. They've got the 5.9 Cummins in them. And uh, they're three-quarter ton work trucks. Yep towing vehicles, you cannot buy a three-quarter ton pickup in the United States right now with a with a stick, with a manual transmission. Nope, you can't. You have to get up into the one-ton class before you can order one with a stick. It has to be a commercial truck that before you can find an autom a manual transmission in the truck. Yeah, and I'm, I'm thinking almost, too, that you might even go so far as to it might even have to be a diesel. I don't know. It may maybe it does. I think it does. I, I could be wrong. Don't quote me on that. But I think we've gotten to the point now where it's 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 got to be a diesel. I I'm pretty sure most of your Ford trucks ended um, back in the early 2000s. You know, with their half ton pickups, they used to be able to get that little crappy 4.2 V6 they had with a mm -hmm. high speed behind it. And I, that's all gone. And uh, the Ranger pickups were all, all the standards had been taken away from them. So, yeah, I, th I really think you're probably right. It's. Uh... Well, I, as, and as a result, that, uh, that four wheel drive truck I've got, it's an 04 model, is right this minute, it's worth what I paid for it. Yeah. Because people want those things. People want them. And. In we're going to be looking like Cuba here in a few years and <laughs> driving these old cars. <laughs> Everybody driving an 05 truck. Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, and that, that my diesels don't have to have the DEF. They're just a whole lot simpler. I don't even know what that shit does. Do you have any idea what that blue shit is? What it, what it does is it, it it's a chemical way to do what they used to do with the air pumps. See, what they used to do is they used to pump air into the exhaust to try to reburn. So it would finish burning. Yeah, so basically what it does, it does a finish burn in the, in the catalytic converters and stuff. So it keeps the, uh, the uh, emissions cool come out, clean coming out the back of them. And so the blue stuff is just a, a oxygen source? Is that what it is? Um, 
I'm not sure exactly 100% what the chemical compound is, but it, it does similar to what the air pump used to do by, by putting it in there. The, the cheap, poor way was, you know, manufactured, put a pump in, pump air in the exhaust. Obviously, if it burns it or not, there's going to be, with more air going in right. the exhaust afterwards. You- it's going to dilute the pollution. Right. I, uh, yeah. That's the numbers. Okay. It's just a dilution calculation. It, it's like watering it down before it goes out the right. exhaust. Well, that's... Uh, uh, that is interesting. Uh, so, what do you think about the future of this situation? Are you looking forward to owning a Tesla? Um, no, I won't own a Tesla. I'm, I'm actually, I've been involved in some electric car builds recently. Um, one for a TV show, and um, I've been, I've been talking with a manufacturer about driving one of their electric vehicles. And I think it's one of those things that, to be honest, I have to try it before I knock it. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't know as to like it. I, I don't see it myself of being the next king of electric or anything. But um, I also think that that's, unfortunately, that's just where it's going. I mean, really, we can, when all we're really doing is diluting down the fact of, okay, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be green now. It's kind of like the people that go to church for the status symbol. It's like right. buying a green car. Well, we, we go buy a green car and we're driving a green car, but we destroy the environment from batteries and disposal and everything. All right. You're just pushing the, you're pushing the, the, the uh, immediate responsibility one layer away from you to the electric generators, the electric generation provider. He's polluting, but you're not, so you feel better about it. And now you're green and morally superior and all this other shit. Yeah. Uh, I I have driven a Tesla one time. And the damn thing is torquey. You'd have to say that. It's got a hell of a bunch of torque. It's a it's a different experience than a than an actual car. And then they came out with the idea of that roadster, the little the little two seater. Zero to 60 and 1.9. Yeah. Now, what is that, like 4Gs or something like that? I mean, that's... Quite four, but it's up there. It's it's um, it's I a... I don't think it's quite two, but it is... I mean, it's a... That's an acceleration experience that most people have never never experienced. But I... Uh, they, they were talking about the, the Roadster five years ago. And they haven't got it in production yet. Nick, do you know what the schedule is on that? What's what is what's I the heard him on Joe Rogan the other day, um, and I think he said twenty twenty two. But there was uh, there was there was some holdup, but it's in, it's in process, just like the Cybertruck thing. I wonder what it is. Uh, they're probably going to have it down to one point seven. <laughs> oh, it's something like that. Yeah, one point seven he now. He wanted it faster because when I first heard of yeah. it, it was it was one point nine. He wanted, it, which is stupid. He That's, wanted it faster, and, and nobody can drive and, that. And there's going to be a version that has a rocket on it, like it'll like it'll fly. An actual rocket, <laughs> rocket. Yeah, and he wants, and he also wants to do one that has uh, compressed air, so it can hover. <laughs> no shit. So the rocket is Man. so it's compressed air, so it's hovering, but the rocket propels it. Right. This is the future. He is insane. <laughs> This is like the Jetsons, finally. <laughs> Musk is insane. Yeah, yeah, he's a. I just read that he he's had, an interesting guy. I just read that he invited uh, Putin onto his little clubhouse uh, internet meeting he does just to talk shit, you know, talk shit with him. Yeah, because <laughs> why not? And the Kremlin was like, "Yeah, I think he said that as a mistake." <laughs> <laughs> he didn't really mean that. Did he? <laughs> I'd want to talk to Putin. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I'm I'm not interested in a Tesla. I'm just, you know. They're cool cars. I am. Yeah, they're cool cars. You have to appreciate them in a in a in an aesthetic way. They're beautiful. You know, the the new ones are just gorgeous yeah. bodies. What Fred's talking about is but, exactly right, though. The thing is gonna. I mean, with the new, uh, they've got full self-driving, you know, and the idea is that you will get in the car, it'll drive you to work, and you do, you know, you answer emails and play games while the thing's driving you around, you know. I, I'm not interested in being in a moving car. 
I don't like riding in a car as a passenger. Yeah. Much less the passenger of the car. <laughs> that that doesn't make. Uh, I, I I'm just not. I'm in, sorry. I'm I'm not going to do that. I think that. in California they're working on um, self-driving taxis now. Haven't they moved for something in California where all vehicles have to be electric by a certain year? Right yeah, now? 2035. 2035, yep. You know, 14 years from now, no gasoline will be sold in California. <laughs> somehow I think that's not going to actually happen. Uh, somehow I think that... Uh, it won't matter if it does happen because they won't be part of the country anymore anyway. Nobody can afford gasoline in California. What's it matter? Yeah. <laughs> I wonder what it is now. Have you looked at the price of gas recently? Hell, diesel's up to two fifty. You know, two here in Texas. Two sixty nine now. Yeah. It was almost. No, so like it's gone up eighty cents in the past three or four months. Right. Like you don't think that's got anything to do with the election? No, come on. Come on, man. No, come on, man. Preposterous. Come on, man. Why even the suggestion is un-American? <laughs> <laughs> so Fred's not getting a Tesla, and I'm not either. And, uh, I fucking am. <laughs> I don't know. I wonder, 30 years from now, what, what, what are things going to look like? 30 years from now? 30 Unimagin years from now. Unimaginable. You're going to have the special, don't even know. special license to use gasoline cars. Don't even know. 30 years from now is, I mean, that's really far away in terms of uh, where we'll be. If, with if this. they're really serious about this electric car shit, they have no choice but to go nuclear. Have to. There is no right. mathematical way to do it any other, yep. to have, to, for any other approach yep. to actually generate sufficient power I mean, hell, they can't keep the air. They can't keep the heaters on in Texas yeah. when it gets to five below zero. Yeah. But you want them to to charge everybody's car to go to work? Yeah. You know what do you? Because you can't reasonably expect everybody to get uh, solar panels and stuff. You know, I mean, you could get the, that back to what I was saying before. They're going to have to. They're going to have to use the fossil fuels to power exactly. the plants to charge exactly the cars. Right. So we right. the fossil yeah. fuel anyway. Right. Exactly. That's exactly what's it. So nuclear is the only way out of this. And for some reason, if you actually want to be green. We can't even have that conversation, yeah. can we? If you actually want to be green, it's going to be nuclear. It right. has to be nuclear if you want to be green. Right. Uranium is green. It glows green. Right? <laughs> it's got a green glow. Sing it with kryptonite. Oh, yeah. That's, you're right. I am. I, never mind. Okay. Well, Fred, anything else on your mind, man? What's. What uh, what we leave out? What what cool thing uh, are you doing now? I'm actually doing a couple of cool things right now. I just uh, finished up with uh, Street Outlaws down in uh, Oklahoma City, doing some builds for them, and uh, getting ready to head down to Gulf Shores, Alabama. I'm on a TV show down there where I'm going to uh, build some houses down on the beach. We'll be Battle of the Beach, so I'll be uh, one of the lead carpenters on that with. Uh, a couple of contestants under me, and we're going to see if uh, we can build better than the other people. So, got that going on. And that show's called what? Battle on the Beach. Battle on the Beach. We'll look for that. Yep. And uh, I've got some car builds that are coming up. Um, you asked me earlier what my, what my favorite car was, and I said uh, an 86 Mustang. Well, I actually own the car that I would I would cruise around in. And um, unfortunately, uh, the car was totaled here in Oklahoma City on my way home from Cannonball Run in 2019. And I'm putting the car back together now. So uh, I'm doing the build on that. Uh, that'll all be, you know, televised and it'll all be uh, put together on a on a YouTube channel and stuff so everybody can follow that. And uh, that's a 1979 Cobra wide body that was in the Miami Vice TV show from the 80s. And uh, it's got a Cobra IRS in it, a Cobra <laughs> 4 cam, and a manual transmission, and 70 gallons of fuel. It's a pretty cool car. <laughs> so so we yeah. got that car going back together. Um, I've got a Hawaiian Tropic car here that we're building for the 50th anniversary of the Cannonball Run. We're having a party down here for the 50th anniversary this fall. And I'm building a car for um, MVP, uh, Maine Veterans Program, uh, back in Maine. It's 
it's all all my time all the all everything i have donated to the, the and it's a corvette i'm not i'm i i do i do appreciate all cars for what they are we're uh taking a 70s uh corvette uh the 70s style corvette i think it's a c3 corvette and um i i volunteered we're gonna put an lq uh ls motor in it and um it's going to have an automatic so that some of the veterans with the amputees and stuff can drive around right. in it or go in parades. And, and uh, uh, Son of Think Customs up in uh, Kansas has volunteered to paint the car for the, for the veterans. So I, I've got quite a bit of cool stuff kind of going on. And uh, really, when I'm not doing that, I'm, I'm working on my house here down in Oklahoma. And uh, I've chased a lot of cool cars and I've bought a lot of cool cars over the last month. So. Well, that sounds like fun, Fred. I appreciate your time. I'm glad you, you stopped what you're doing to sit down with us and talk, and we'll do it again. Uh, always, the cars are a big, fun thing of mine, and I always enjoy talking to somebody who's got a, a, a informed opinion about such things. I always appreciate coming on, and I love, I love talking about cars. And, and uh, my dad always said I had the gift of gab, and I could probably talk about anything. But, yep. Uh, I'm very fortunate. I appreciate you guys having me on the show, and uh, I'd love to come back and talk about anything you'd like. Absolutely, Fred. We'll do it again soon. I appreciate your time again. And thank you for watching us on Starting Strength Radio. We'll see you next Friday. Bye now.